can draw really well And this is how I can tell She drew me and made it look like my head's normal size Please welcome Sarah Mayhew scared you are all going to be hung over from donuts and bacon and your beverage of choice, but I'm glad we're all awake here. So I am Sarah Mayhew. I am a mangaka, which I always have to explain what that is to people. I write and illustrate manga style graphic novels. Manga being a form of comic book which originated from Japan and uh, was made popular um, by its animated counterpart, anime, with uh, shows popular like Dragon Ball Z, Sailor Moon, um, Oscar Award winning Spirited Away, um, and I write and illustrate basically the comic book form of that type of medium. Um, I also teach a uh, um, arts program in the summer for young children, uh, teaching them how to draw manga. Are my slides working? Go. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Hi. That's me. Um, I yes, I also um, uh, am a uh, manga illustrating instructor, and I thought maybe for you folks this morning, I might give you just a little quick lesson. Um, on how to draw manga that maybe you guys can practice with each other in the Del Mar later. <laughs> if I'm a good teacher. Okay, here we go. Got the blackboard up. Now, the key to drawing manga, of course, is the big eyes, you want to exaggerate the features, little noses, little mouths. Um, it's a lot of cuteness, cute, cute eyes, cute nose, cute mouth. This is uh, what, what we refer to more as a chibi style drawing. It means that everything is sort of super deformed to be more childlike in appearance, um, but it's not a child, it's an adult. Now, if you add nerd vision and the required science beard, um, you can create Phil Plate, <laughs> the bad astronomer. Now, here's uh, my little version of a uh, magic trick. It's a manga magic trick. You just Take your tracing paper, do the same thing over again, or even just cross out the name, and now you have Richard Wiseman. You didn't even have to change anything. <laughs> it doubles. It, you get bang for your buck. Now this is for my more advanced students out there. This one's a little bit trickier, but we can modify this again, and if we remove the science beard and thicken up the glasses and you gotta get the eyebrows tilted you get George Trop. <laughs> Vest and all. So you just... <laughs> what? 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 Oh! There, there we go! <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you! <laughs> <laughs> Science lesson. 
a manga lesson. Okay, so what we have next here. A life of art and skepticism. I live in two worlds, between two worlds, where skepticism inspires my art and art has an influence um, on my love for skepticism. Um, these two worlds are kind of contrasting. You have skepticism where it involves a lot of being objective while the art world is clearly a lot of uh, subjective um, uh, material. But in the art world, you still do have to follow rules and know those rules before you know how to be able to bend them or break them. Um, and so to me, um, to me, I want to talk to you guys today about how my skepticism sort of crosses over and, and complements my art and vice versa. Now, uh, my background is in graphic design, which is the kind of art that's more closely tied to um, advertising and communication. Uh, I come from a small town in Northern Ontario. Insert your uh, uh, Neil. <laughs> Neil, Neil, help me out here, Neil Young. Neil Young, insert Neil Young reference here. I come from a small town in Northern Ontario. Um, and I feel fortunate um, science in my life, especially technology, um, can let me uh, enter a field like art and still live up in the north. Um, my family has a long history of living up there. And I can really tell that I get a lot of my uh, creative um, uh, inclinations from my parents. My mom uh, loves to write. She has a great imagination. She has a, a love for learning about science, just like I do. And my father, he's, uh, although very logical, he, um, he, he's interested in the visual arts and film, uh, filmmaking and music. Um, but when you get married when you're 19 in the 70s in Kirkland Lake, Ontario, you uh, have a limited selection of um, what fields you can go into. And up north, it's uh, mainly, you know, um, resource-based, a lot of mining and forestry. And so um, I kind of take it seriously that I'm so fortunate that I can work anywhere in the world as long as I have a Wi-Fi connection. Um, I can work with my clients and I can reach out and, and give content to my readers um, without having to pick up and move away from family or move to a big city. And um, that's something that maybe previous generations, you know, m maybe you know, missed out on people who could have been great writers, great musicians, um, but just, you know, couldn't, um, couldn't leave uh, the North. And um, so that's a really big part of my life. That's how, a, a, a big part of how science has contributed practically to my life, is delivering the technologies that allow me to live way up north and, and still interact with people and work with clients from all over the world and put my work up online um, for the world to see. Um, and uh, art, uh, art and skepticism, it's a, it's a little bit, as I said, um, you wouldn't think the two would be easy to mix, but I think they, they can help one another. And so being a, being a um, artist in skepticism, um, I'm, I'm the artist and I feel like then I go out into the art world 
and I'm the skeptic. And so um, it's this little, little world that I'm stuck in between, but I love it. And I am always um, trying to think, trying to, even when I'm working in art, which is very subjective, I always have in the back of my mind the sort of tools um, and ideas that um, we learn in skepticism. So I think it's helped me creatively to sort of think outside the box. Um, because as an artist, I think you have um, sort of a uh, artist's uh, spidey sense, like a common, it's almost like in skepticism, we know common sense, you know, isn't, isn't always the way to go. And I think you can get uh, stuck in that in art too, that you just have these feelings of what should be right and you can get stuck. One of my favorite um, examples uh, of avoiding this is the uh, Star Trek reboot plot. Um, you'll, you'll notice, and this is influenced a lot by um, the hero's journey uh, that Joseph Campbell made popular, had a real impact on how um, Hollywood movies flow. And what usually happens is you have um, the second act low point. And what happens with a character is they start off a certain way and they need to learn a lesson or change something about themselves that they learn through the plot. And the second half low point is when, okay, you have to figure this out and change and come out of this you know, so you can, you can start the third act and complete your quest. And what I love about the reboot is Captain Kirk starts off arrogant and saying, no, I am right and I'm going to win. And he ends up at his second act low point on, fro on a frozen moon with no seeming escape. And his first thought is, when I get back on the Enterprise, when I get back on the Enterprise, I am reporting Spock. <laughs> and there's no thought of, you know, he's not thinking, geez, maybe I should be more humble, or maybe I, you know, maybe I th should sit here and, and think of what Spock, no. He knows he's gonna get off, and the story ends with him just as, just as an arrogant son of a bitch that he started out as, except now he's captain of the starship as well. So I love that, you know, that uh, storyline where it's you don't always have to have the character change themselves. You can have the character change the situation around them instead. Another issue I have, because, because the whole hero's journey um, a way of telling a story. To me, it's starting to get a little, um, a little old <laughs> to me. You can get inside these, these traps of these plots, especially in anything that has to do with fantasy. And um, if you're familiar with Harry Potter, you might have heard a lot, you know, like Harry Potter follows the, you know, the hero's journey, the mythology, you know, like his story is just like Jesus. He goes through the same, you know, he is, is it, he here and there and, you know, the resurrection and Harry Potter is not Jesus, okay? Harry Potter is not Jesus and <laughs> here's why. The hero's journey without the uh, the very most important part of the hero's journey is the sort of spiritual revelation that the character will have where they change spiritually to become the whole masters of the two worlds thing at the end. And Harry Potter does not do that. Harry Potter starts off, he grows physically, <laughs> he gets taller and older, um, but he's still the same Harry is still brave and loyal and he has a certain point of view 
that doesn't change um, all throughout the series. He grows a bit as a person, but his actual character never makes a shift where he, he changes sort of his spirit um, and becomes a different person. And so I think without that, looking at that with a critical eye, is if you take that away from the hero's journey, you just have a bunch of things that usually have to show up in an adventure story. You know, there's gonna be some sort of father figure, you know, wizard um, to help you along. There's going to be magic artifacts. There's going to be, um, you know, trials to pass. And these are just, um, you know, you can fall into this uh, pattern seeking and almost anything with a beginning, a middle, and an end in fantasy um, can look like the hero's journey if you don't care that about the, the spiritual transformation at the end. Now, <laughs> now um, last year at, in my talk, I, um, I, I did a, a little bit of Twilight bashing. I, I felt a little bad for that. I, I'm, I may have done the old thing where you refer to the Twilight characters uh, as cardboard and that being an insult to an otherwise sturdy packaging material. <laughs> Um, and, and, but sort of explaining that um, in art, the key is connecting to people um, on an emotional level. Um, and my point is, it's, it's too easy to twilight bash. Like, it's, I felt bad about it. But I did have the point that you can take something that is uh, technically, um, technically not very high quality writing in itself and uh, not high quality characters, but it's immensely popular because it, it knows, she know, the author knows even how to just cheaply push the emotional buttons and people love it because it has that really strong emotional connection to people. And I wanted, I wanted to point out that um, the character Bella gets a real bad rap too. <laughs> um, there are tons of memes where it's like, yeah, I'm Hermione and I did all, you know, my boyfriend left me and I did this and I did this spell and defeated this thing. And uh, um, Katniss, she's a strong character and, and then poor, there's poor Bella, she does nothing ever. She just sits around and she, you know, adjusts her hair and mumbles all the time and thinks of Twilight the Vampire Man, whatever his name is. <laughs> um, but to be fair to the people who really love, uh, who really love this character, Bella, um, again, my sort of critical thinking, my, my, interest in skepticism got me thinking more more about poor Bella and I thought you know uh, you you come across these strong female characters um, two of my favorite are Hermione and Katniss um, because they're they're very active you know they're they take a role the um, you know, the other two boys in Harry Potter, Harry and Ron, you know, they would be screwed without Hermione. Like, nothing would have happened. <laughs> they would have died in the first book without her. Um, but she's also, you know, she's also uh, quite feminine as well. Um, and then you have Katniss as uh, an incredibly strong female character as well, who's a fighter, yeah, um, going in, you know, going into a battle royale. <laughs> um, and then you have poor Bella stuck being passive. And she does a lot of sitting around and thinking of her feelings and having um, other people do things for her. 
And, but what you have to realize is people don't, saying, well, Bella's a poor role model for people. People don't typically pick up a book because they're looking for a role model. Um, Bella's being enjoyed because there are a great many teenagers who like to sit around and think about their feelings and be passive and they have a lot of emotion and Bella sort of fulfills this fantasy as here is finally a main character of a book who is like me. They're not like, I don't have a bow and arrow. I, I suck at archery and I can't do magic. And you know, a Bella is is a more even though the writing you know isn't top notch the idea of this type of character being the main focus of a story is very i think very important um if you look at it as something that isn't being delivered to obviously a bunch of young people who are looking for that the only problem being is you can make a character with um, these more passive, more introvert char characteristics and still have them be the hero of the story um, in a better and make her a better role model um, to young people. Um, when, when I first started getting interested in anime, I came across a series called Fushiki Yugi. And before that, um, I was kind of a, a tomboy. I didn't like girly things, and I think it was because I had a lot of my Western role models in um, Western media and film. If you're a strong woman, you you lack a certain femininity about you. You may they may be dressed up sexy, but rarely would you come across a strong female character who is girly, you know, who cares about boys and hair and shoes and makeup and pretty things. And then came along this anime from Japan with the most girly schoolgirl main character in what they call a reverse harem anime where it's a girl and a bunch of hot guys that all <laughs> that that all um focus their attention on her and what i realized was even though she was really girly and she was, she needed to get saved a lot from things and she had ribbons in her hair and she was always thinking about boys and being in love when it came to what her character needed to do to be the hero of the story, she could be that hero in her own way. And so what I came back from, from all of this later, um, when I was a skeptic and sort of trying to turn this skeptical eye towards, um, uh, towards my field, was that a strong character doesn't mean necessarily that you're a badass archer in a battle royale and it doesn't necessarily mean you know that um you're a wizard or a warrior uh what a strong character means is that the writer focuses on your point of view and trying to get the reader to empath empathize um with how that character operates and lives in the world that you've created. So you can, you could have um, a character like Bella. You could argue that technically she is a strong character because you're getting to see her point of view where she, you know, she's not, she's not active. She, she's not, she's a passive girl. Um, but the thing about having, you know, the thing about freedom is it's all about choice and to show that this is, you know, this is the difference between you, you, you can make these choices and it's okay. And so that's what I came back from, from seeing a series like Fushigi Yugi 
with um, a character that maybe people at first glance would say is weak. Um, that to me, it really changed me in saying, okay, well, I can put on these frilly outfits and, uh, and, and do my hair and my nails and be all girly and giggle. And it doesn't mean that I can't be still, you know, a hero of the story. Um, so that had a big impact on me. Otherwise, you're left with sometimes strong uh, female characters basically just being male characters in a female body. And so, um, I think I'm going to materialize again. There we go. <laughs> oh, did, did we miss the, the materialization again here? I love it. <laughs> um, and so what, the, what this translates to me as a artist in skepticism is realizing that um, be, being aware of who your audience is and what you want to say to them and how do you take that message and connect to people emotionally with it. Because when people when people can identify, when you can, when you can have them empathize with a character who perhaps has a different point of view from them, that's a really strong way of, of having people think or get attached to an idea. I mean, we all know this from the other side. We can all see this from how emotionally seductive um, sort of woo stuff can be, um, and I don't think there's any reason why you can't, in a better way, do this for science and skepticism. There's, there's a clear reason why people love Carl Sagan's Cosmos, and it's because you feel his amazement and wonder and appreciation and beauty for what he's showing to you. You connect emotionally with the story he's telling about the universe. There's a reason why we all love seeing Neil deGrasse Tyson come up here, because he's full of character and emotion, and he's getting you laughing, and um, you're connecting emotionally with what he's saying, um, not just um, absorbing the content of what he's speaking about. And so what my work involves, um, is creating stories, creating um, sci-fi fantasy stories um, that have characters that you know I'm I'm trying to remember not to fall into the the easy stereotypes of what is a strong character and who is not, but also trying to um, trying to take advantage of the fact that when you read fiction you're taking your reader into a, a different world, a different scenario, and being able to get them to see, to view this through other people's eyes. And so you can, you can get people to empathize and almost trick them <laughs> into empathizing with people that maybe they might, they might not um, in real life, if that person was just trying to debate directly with them, you can sort of go on this journey with them and come out the other side and, and have a better understanding of the idea um, that's trying to be conveyed in the story. So with my own uh, titles that I'm writing, my recent book is Legend of the Star, which is available in all retail stores, it's a, a digital publication. Um, the main hero, uh, she's, a, she's skeptically minded and is operating in this sort of sword and sandals, sci-fi, fantasy world um, with a lot of other characters that just are, aren't really aware of that type of thinking, very alien to them, and how she goes through this journey of, um, 
affecting the characters around her. Um, and this way, um, it's an alternative to simply um, sitting in a conference center listening to lectures, <laughs> which is great, and we all love that. But reading, reading books is a different experience where you can teach people, you can, you can deliver messages to people, and they might not even be consciously aware um, of what they're receiving. Um, it's almost like uh, inception. You plant the seed of the idea, and then it grows on its own, and people feel like they came to that idea more themselves and are more likely to be attached and, and understand that idea through that method. Um, so what I'd like to end with is the idea that um, you, can, you can use art uh, to communicate a message um, and really because it's, it's the, the psychics and the Reiki masters and, and the conspiracy theorists are so good at getting people, you know, getting them right in the, right in the heart of like, yeah, uh, uh, conspiracy theory or oh, yeah, the, the energies of the, oh, it's so seductive. And to me, science is seductive too. There's, there's so much beauty in science and I feel there's, there's, there's so much beauty in skepticism too as a tool to be able to distinguish what is um, true um, from what we simply want to be true. And I think it's really important um, to be able Okay, <laughs> to, to be able to do that. So, um, please uh, check out my work. Uh, there, I have some books here in the library, signing at one. And also, I need to remind you that you can uh, sign up to play poker against me and several other of my fellow uh, speakers at the Skeptics Poker. Uh, tonight, sign up and um, take all my money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>